Great. Um, so just as context, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, so th this session is being hosted by Sarah Carr and by Octo. Um, and let me get, sorry, I had a list of all the um, Octo products. <laughs> sorry, I am not as organized as I should be. Um, there is the, oh crap, I'm so sorry, I opened the wrong one. Sarah, are oh, you I can. Yeah, I can do it. So welcome everyone. Um, and as, as many of you know from previous webinars, I'm Sarah Carr and I am with Octo. I'm coordinator of the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, EBM Tools Network for short, and editor of the Skimmer. And uh, Octo also has uh, a number of other um, products, including openchannels.org, MPA News, and um, the Marine Debris Info MDI. Uh, Marine debris list serve. So, and we're, we're, we're very pleased to have everyone here today for today's panel. Thank you, John. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And that was embarrassing. So, great. We just start off. <laughs> anyway, um, so as context, so th this webinar is all about how can scientists Im improve their impact and kind of um, have see more in the real world. And this, this built off a webinar that um, we did back in December of 2019, which was based on a, a paper I'd worked on. And there was a lot of interest in follow up. And I really wanted to hear more from different people with different perspectives who, who see where we agree, where we disagree, and kind of all learn from each other. Um, they'll introduce themselves in a moment. They've got a really good mix of perspectives. Um, I will note we're missing a lot of voices. We don't have anyone here from the Global South. Um, I'd love suggestions of who else I should be looking at and learning from. So uh, you can the chat or, or email later on, you could let us know. So quick logistics, the session is being recorded. Everyone who registers will have the link emailed to them. Um, for the panel discussion, it's gonna be a little unusual. We're, we're trying to have it be more dynamic and quick answers rather than uh, longer. So we're gonna target about a minute apiece. If you see me kind of waving, that's me giving our, our panelists a clue. Might be time to move on. We've got three questions up front that I'm gonna uh, spend about 15 minutes apiece letting the panel explore. And during this time, you can use the Q&A function. So down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. So if as the panel is, is talking, you have a question, you can put in the question. You can use the thumbs up button to like somebody else's question, and you can even comment on the questions. So once we finish those three sessions and we turn to audience Q&A, we'll be starting with the questions that you all have voted on as the most interesting. So just through, as you go, think of questions. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the panel to introduce themselves. Um, I'll just go from left to right on my screen. So Lynn, do you want to start? Yes, thank you very much, John, and uh, welcome to all our participants. I am Lynn Scarlett, the Chief External Affairs Officer of the Nature Conservancy. We operate in 70 plus countries around the world with a focus on addressing climate and conservation. We are a very science informed organization with maybe 500 scientists on our staff. Um, but I'm here wearing my recovering decision maker hat. I served as the Deputy Secretary and Chief Operating Officer of the Department of the Interior uh, in the 2000s, 2000 to 2008. Great, thanks, Lynn. Oh, also I forgot. I'm John Fisher. I work for the Pew Charitable Trust. Sorry about that. I'm based in, in DC and, and organized this panel. Um, Christian, would you like to go next? Yes, hello to everybody. I'm Christian Pohl. I'm a co-director of the Transdisciplinarity Lab of ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And uh, transdisciplinarity in the European sustainability, continental European sustainability context, Mark, <laughs> means uh, that different researchers from different disciplines and people from practice collaborate on uh, socially relevant issues, basically. And I think in the US, this might be more termed as convergence research plus participatory research plus action, action research. So you have a, a bit of different framing. And we are a, a unit at the department that is dedicated to do and uh, do research on this kind of research. Great, thank you. Um, and I've got Mark next, please. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Reed. I am a professor of rural entrepreneurship at Scotland's Rural College and director of the thriving Natural Capital Challenge Centre there. I'm also research lead for an international conservation charity and chief executive of Fast Track Impact, which is an international training company working on impact. That's based on my research uh, that has uh, attempted over the last decade or so to try and understand how it is that impact happens and how we can, as researchers, do this much more effectively and efficiently. Uh, it's based in part on my book, The Research Impact Handbook, and one of the courses that, uh, that we run is on influencing policy. Great, thank you. And Yoshi? 
Hi, everyone. Um, Joan, thank you so much. You've been very organized, you know. Um, and, and, and hello to my um, co participants. I was so looking forward to participating this. My name is Yoshi Ota. I'm a research assistant professor at the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs, SMEA, in University of Washington. Um, and I'm also a director of Nippon Foundation Ocean Nexus Center, which is a newly established center. We got it. Uh, uh, this year and um, sitting in Arslab, which led by the Ben Bakado, a friend of mine, and who is in the audience. Hi, Ben. Um, we work with Ocean Next Center. We're trying to put social equity and justice as a center of ocean governance. And that's really where we're uh, thriving towards. And we are um, hoping to use both social and natural science in the disciplinary approach um, to make that happen. Um, so that's what I'm leading with my. Uh, 20, 30 colleagues and the professors who are working with me. Thanks, Joe. Great, thank you all so much. Um, just a couple of quick logistics. I see some people are, are raising their hand. Um, we're not actually going to be, be calling on you. So if you do have a question, again, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom and you can just put in a question whenever. Um, and then we had one participant say that they're hearing impaired and asked that all the speakers keep their camera on. So everyone who is speaking does have their camera on and just uh, for, for people like me who are forgetful, try to enunciate a little bit and make sure we're all visible, that'll, that'll help out. So with that, I wanted to turn to the first question to the panel. So what really motivated me to work on this topic was my own failures, was writing papers that I thought nobody should read or that wasn't gonna change the world in any way. And it was really frustrating. So I'd like to ask you all, where have you seen the most missed opportunity for science to have impact? In other words, what should scientists be working on to do better? And I have no particular order in mind, so just um, dive in. So John, this is Lynn. Um, I'll dive in and wearing my recovering decision maker hat. Uh, you know, when you think about the challenges in front of us, the scale and the interconnectedness of those challenges, whether it's hypoxia, effects of climate change on coasts and oceans, species dynamics, offshore development, all of those put a premium on holistic thinking and transdisciplinary science. I'm delighted that, uh, that we have Christian with us with that focus. But while we see a broadening of transdisciplinary science to integrate across issues, I think we still face a lot of knowledge data and analytic silos. Um, and in particular, we face notable challenges of understanding social sciences dimensions relating, for example, to addressing the effects of a changing climate. And I just want to give an example. If you consider coastal resilience in the context of extreme storms, at one level, of course, science is incredibly important, understanding the role of oyster reefs in wave attenuation. But at the intersection of decision making, you need to understand the relationship of that natural infrastructure to built infrastructure, how do they interrelate, what's cost effective, but even more important uh, to get traction for natural infrastructure, you need to understand the attitudes of people. What do they perceive? What do they want? How to enhance learning and engage them in understanding options. And we, we missed a big opportunity after Hurricane Katrina and I see my minute is up, but an upsurge in science illuminating the role of nature but a failure to really see it get traction um, as that interface with people was really missing. Great, thank you. I think I could um, <clears throat> build on that. I think uh, it's true Lynn, that the social sciences are certainly not uh, um, acknowledged as they should, but I also think there is the big, it's a bit abstract, but I think the big problem we have is that people mostly think of the science practice, science policy, uh, interface as something that is requires linear transfer of little pieces of knowledge and it's all about the cognitive and I think that's completely wrong I think it is a super complex interesting chaotic <laughs> system <laughs> where it has the cognitive side it has the, the side of trust of mutual relationships of knowing each other uh, it has it is to some extent you can plan what passes what knowledge transfer and what not to some you can't plan to some extent it just things just happen. Whatever is transferred might be taken by this person to do what you think he or she should do, or it might be taken for to do something completely different. So I think that's the main missing thing for me is that we don't have an adequate understanding of this complex thing that is called science policy uh, nexus. 
Yeah, to build on, on that, I think uh, that therefore means that we have to go down the stairs of our ivory tower uh, to climb over a few fences and take that step of empathy into the shoes of the people that we want to ultimately help. And only from that perspective can we understand the, the context, uh, the, the emotional subjective context within which people will actually take and potentially use, misuse, or in other ways adapt the, the knowledge that we have. And I think that the, the biggest thing that we miss as researchers is that connection. And we think that we're, we're saving time by lobbing our ideas out from the top window of our ivory tower, uh, but the majority of them miss the mark. Um, and actually many of them uh, end up squashing people quite painfully. <laughs> So um, I suppose, can I go, John? Please, so yeah. I, I feel the, the, the world has been changing quite radically, both environmentally and socially, like Lynn said, and then there's definitely uh, a, a need to address this just whole uh, a complexity, you know, through science and the social science. Um, but I think one of the opportunities that we have been missing is really to speak about uh, uh, what scientists are not so accustomed to speak about. Equity, diversity, inclusion, justice. It's more like humanities, it's more like social science, but I don't think we don't have to defend ourselves to speak about it. So um, that's the one opportunity, have that conversation. I think it's really important. And another opportunity is obviously education. I mean, we all are educators, so we really could actually you know, bring the capacity and a new way of thinking, shake the conversations. And then that's a, that's a second thing. The last thing is I really think, you know, when we translate the science to something else, we are afraid of speak in a very complex terms. We're trying to make it simpler so people can understand. But I have an argument, you know, I share, I watch TV with my kids and kids nowadays with my children. And, and they're so getting into such complex stories in cartoons and the films and they enjoy equally with the ones which are very simple. So I really think that if we actually get to what's systemically wrong with this system, what is really the cause clearly, then we don't have to be afraid of speaking about the complexity. And then we don't have to be afraid and defend ourselves to speak the things that we haven't usually speak about. Thanks. John, this is Lynn. May I build a little bit on what some folks have said? Please do. We have about nine more minutes to kind of for you all just to kind of go in. Great, great. So, uh, absolutely concur with what others have said and Christian want to settle on something that you said. Um, you know, when I talk about transdisciplinarity and the interface of social sciences and, uh, and the natural sciences, um, this is as much about the content of the science, that is how do people learn cognition, behavioral sciences, as it is about how we engage the processes, boundary processes, um, it's not so much a matter of just understanding that social science, but what are the process of engagement by which one brings those stakeholders, those lenses in uh, so that uh, we don't need only to be empathetic to what people think, but actually they are themselves representing their thoughts. Sorry, I know I'm supposed to be just moderating, but I, this makes me think of something. I, I was in a great session yesterday about racial equity and research. And one of the things that, that they talked about as, as part of equity was, um, you know, thinking about your bias and what don't you know. And so something that really struck me as a scientist, you know, at least my default is also like, often like, I know these things, I just need to tell people things and then they'll do the right stuff. Um, as opposed to asking, you know, what don't I know? Who have I never listened to? Um, and so some of the, the common themes here about kind of empathy and understanding people is also sort of, I think, suppressing maybe our instinct to say, we're gonna lead with the facts I have rather than kind of asking what else I, I don't know yet. Can I come in as a uh, social scientist? I, you know, I'm trained as a social anthropologist. So my training was all very much uh, 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 theories and structures, understanding cultures. And then, you know, my research was spending the time with a fisherman in different oceans and, you know, occasionally have a drink in, in a pub or, or somewhere else. And, and really trying to understand what is, you know, what they need, 
you know, what needs to be addressed and how the social organization works. And, and so when I start working with natural scientists, all what I was thinking about, okay, how can I translate my knowledge or put in the same platform as, uh, with, with, with the natural scientists? So I'm trying to do the mapping and, you know, uh, 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 statistics and interview and the surveys and all this. But then I realized the work of the social science, yes, understanding how social organization works, it's very important, but at the same time, our job is to bring critical perspective on how we approach in the things. So exactly what Lynn said, how we're approaching with people, engaging with the people, how we think who is the stakeholders and how we should actually use the data. Um, so really what I think is those, you know, the core conversation, the critical perspective, which social scientists breathe and sometimes people like, hey, that doesn't really feed into my data and analysis. But I think that's the conversation both natural and social scientists sometimes would like to have in order to address the urgent need for the policy. I say something to that. I think, uh, Yoshi, I think that's you, you were talking about the critical self reflection, I think. And for me, that's one of the cumbersome parts of inter and transdisciplinary research because all of a sudden you're out of your peer group. And that means that all the things that you take for granted are not shared by the others. So you always have to explain, okay, why is this the case? Why are you sure that this is a, a good evidence? And all these kind of things. And that takes a lot of time, which is perhaps cumbersome, but I think it's also a very interesting part where you learn a lot about your own uh, blind spots and what other possibilities could be to do good science. And to the, I have another to, to Lynn. Um, so in another project in, in, in Sweden, we kind of looked at what do people, what do people from practice take out of transdisciplinary collaborations? And this was a collaboration with um, city, city agencies. And we thought, okay, they take the facts that we provide. But one of the things they took out was the way we co-produce knowledge. So the method we have, <laughs> and we were so, very surprised. So, Again, this is like a restriction in our brains that we think they only take the facts. There, there are other things that they could uh, take and uh, move on with it further on. You know, just another word about that. Th this is, I, I love this topic. Um, you know, we talked about complexity and the challenges of conveying complexity. Christian, you made the point that the challenge in interfacing with decision-making is not linear. And we've talked about, you know, collaboration and so forth. Um, we've talked about, also um, matters of sort of credibility and legitimacy and those link to process, that is the processes of engagement. But I also wanna say, you know, working with the Army Corps of Engineers um, and looking at the deep water horizon and risk reduction, uh, you know, as scientists, one can often go into looking at risks and prioritizing what one thinks are the highest risks where one ought to deploy scarce resources for risk reduction. You engage in co-production of knowledge. That is, what is it that people really care about? And you find that their hierarchy or ranking of issues may be quite different. And if you tap that knowledge, it can actually help to um, delineate your, your research agenda in a way that you may not otherwise have thought about. Really great point. That's something Lynn, you and I have talked about a bit is just, you know, um, needing to, to understand and respect the legitimacy of different decision making processes and especially, um, you know, that yes, science is part of it, but there's also what do people value. There's also kind of competing values. And that was cer certainly something that all these things seem obvious when you say them, but it's really not natural for me. Um, I think Mark, sorry, you were going to jump in as well. Yeah, so this, this co-productive method, I think, is uh, at the core of a lot of uh, the, the best research impact on policy um, and it's because it's not just that linear process of hey some evidence and then some policy of course these are policy decisions and i don't think there's any such thing as evidence-based policy or at least there shouldn't be only evidence-informed policy that takes all the lines of evidence uh, with competing lines of argument and then makes what are necessarily uh, value judgments uh, at, at the end of the day uh, some of the research that my colleagues and i have done on this uh, has tried to understand what is the role of process design uh, versus uh, different kinds of contexts uh, in dictating the outcomes of participatory and increasingly co-productive processes. 
uh, looking at in particular at social and environmental outcomes. And I'll put a link to uh, the first of these papers um, into the chat, and there's another one I'll put in in a moment. But one of the things that I find uh, really interesting about this uh, the study is that uh, that we showed that. Uh, the more diverse you make these groups, um, the more the chances are for uh, social outcomes. Uh, so including uh, social learning, reduced conflict, increased trust, things like that. Um, uh, and yet at the same time, um, having uh, high level policy people with decision-making power, we found actually decreased the level of creativity and trust building and willingness of people to talk openly. Uh, and yet increase the likelihood of strong environmental outcomes that were actually implemented. And so there's something quite interesting going on there, I think, in terms of uh, how and when we engage with the, the policy community uh, and, uh, and asking ourselves, what is it that is most important to us from that process? Super interesting. So, oh, so your, your, your last thought, and I'm going to yeah. put the next question, but please. I'm sorry. I just, I worked with the fishermen and everything else. It's very simple what they need. They just want to keep on fishing and make money, you know, and, and I'm talking about like a small scale fisherman and, and other people engaging industries, they, they just want to keep on having their jobs. Other people working on the coast, they just wanted to, uh, living in a coast, they just wanted to have a safe environment for their kids to enjoy the ocean and, you know, some other things. And it's very straightforward. And it's sometimes that, you know, they have a question why, and I'm talking about small scale fisheries, I'm doing okay. And why my quota is a 10% of every quota. And in those big fishermen, which got the 90%, they are not really accused for the conservation. The other people said exactly the same thing. So the, 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 their question could potentially be very different from what the scientists and everybody else is asking for. And what, they, what we need to have is how can science or mixture with transdisciplinary can answer those questions. And I believe they're not always distrust with, you know, the, the scientists and, and, you know, people, they, 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 they respect the people who's working hard. And I shouldn't say they, because we're one of them, you know? So I feel that the really, whether we can really addressing, we are really addressing the systemic or the issues, core issues, which they really want us to answer. I think that's the core of the conversation and that's where the science needs to head it if we want it to be, you know, more or less engaging. Excellent. All right. So this is awesome. I'm going to ask the next question. Um, for folks who have just joined, um, if you do have any questions, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom. And if you see other questions you like, use the thumbs up button to vote for your favorites. And so once we uh, go through two more questions I've got, then we'll turn the floor over and start answering um, your questions. So for the next question, um, a number of you kind of talked about silos, about needing to bring in different disciplines, about bringing, you know, having social and natural scientists work together. So, so it's one thing I hear a lot is scientists feel like they have to be superheroes. They've got to be a researcher and a communicator and a you know, decision maker and all these things at once. So what has been your experience, either as a scientist getting help from others to be more effective or, at, or collaborating with scientists? Well, this is, this is Lynn, I'll dive in uh, wearing the hat of collaborating with scientists and, and being that recovering decision maker from the interior department. Um, you know, yes, absolutely. Communications is important. The science itself is important. The collaborative skills are important. But not every scientist needs to be all of those things. Um, and so this actually gets back to the point about um, sort of decision processes and the how. Uh, having those collaborative and engaging processes where you may have the scientist that is really focused on their data, their evidence. But then those scientists that perhaps excel at communication, those facilitators who help stitch that conversation together, the stakeholders who are posing questions about the issue framing. Is the issue framed in a way that's meaningful to the decisions that, that need to be undertaken? I think you know, pulling all of those together help to address that, that question that this isn't just about everybody being everything. Figure out what you're good at and then ensure that you have processes where you can put your best foot forward and, and engage. Can I um, follow that? I'm sorry, Kristen, do you want to go first? Okay, thank you. So, uh, Lynn, I agree. And, and, and then I, you know, I, I, I think uh, scientists must not be a superhero. 
superheroes are terrible. You know, they, they, the Batman and everyone else, they, they, they use the violence to solve the things, and then, and then they, they, they feel like they, they're doing a good thing. You know, that this is a quote from my son, twelve years old. Um, and, and, and I really think that, that what scientist is really good at, just be good at what you're doing, just be inspiring. I'm still inspired by uh, um, uh, 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 kind of like a very narrow focused societal uh, social anthropology back in London, we were just always talking to themselves, but I was so inspired. And, and, but what I really think scientists are really good at is they can tell me, well, they can tell us or, or, or they can tell the world, what's the problem? And then that's really the question they really can answer. And then, you know, we, we can rely on that. And, and any of the way communicate and all this, if the data and evidence and, and then all that there, it's, you know, social scientists or anybody else's job to find it. But, you know, if there's natural scientists or anybody else who's doing a complex job to be a little kind to talk to the people, that'd be very helpful. But that's pretty much all I'm asking. Don't be a superhero. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that uh, the key thing here is that, uh, that we engage with this if we want to and on our terms. This should not be something mandatory. And I think that the problem is that this has uh, become dictated by our funders, uh, by governments, etc. Uh, and so there is this real pressure on people. Uh, we've got publish uh, or perish. We've now got impact or implode alongside that. Uh, and this impact agenda is something that I've studied. We've done interviews with researchers in the UK and Australia in particular. It's driving uh, broad scale demotivation, uh, conflicts of interests, and it's biasing research. A quote, I'm going to swear, a quote from one of our interviews, interviewees said, I'm doing shit research now because that's what I thought they wanted, which for me is tragic. And instead, what I think we need to do is we need to create impact cultures that draw people in, that attract people on their own terms so that I can do the stuff that I'm passionate about. Uh, it's maybe not going to change the world, but I want to do skills work or I actually want to, uh, to challenge government policy. And the evidence suggests that you're unlikely or you're less likely to succeed in achieving change if you are going against a prevailing ideology or policy compared to going with the grain. Does that therefore mean we stop challenging government policies that we think are not evidence-based? Well, uh, no, surely not. And it has to come from our sense of intrinsic motivation rather than be extrinsically incentivized. So that means impact doesn't just have to be for people who intrinsically want to make the world a better place. If you are a curiosity-driven researcher, let's get curious about impact. Uh, let's start engaging with policy questions that make me think, huh, this is beyond what I've ever thought of before because it's cross-disciplinary and that open my mind to new ways of thinking. And let's get excited about impact for all those reasons as well. Great, Christian. Yes, I agree with what was said. Um, I think I think markets. If you look at the European research funding, then there are like two streams. Either you become a superhero, which is like you're funded as a person because you're so great, or then is the then is this whole funding for being doing socially relevant research. So I, I don't know there are two classes of people. Um, I apparently more in the in the social relevant research and there i completely agree with you uh, i think there now superheroes are not needed perhaps if you fund persons perhaps these are superheroes at the end but in this collaborative research super collaborators are probably needed <laughs> people that like to collaborate people that as, as mark said that are interested in this collaboration to learn uh, new things to be socially relevant. I don't think actually that this is like bad research because I, I mean, I, I believe a bit in use inspired basic research. So this term that was coined by, by Stokes that also in a context of application, you can do fantastic research that is completely new and asks completely new questions that all the ivory tower people will never even think of. I wanna uh, probe a little bit further uh, some of the comments here. So uh, the comment was made that a role of scientists is to, uh, to define the problem. And I, I wanna push on that, press on that a little bit um, and give two examples. In many cases from the vantage point of a decision maker, uh, part of the challenge is actually framing the problem set. That is, what is it that's the decision we're trying to address? And let me give you an example. So in Tomales Bay, 
there were water quality problems. And initially the sort of science framing was, what's the extent of the water quality problem? But for about a decade, as that, as that question played out, you had data battles and no, it's not this, it's that. And it really came down to, well, wait a minute, we don't just wanna understand the extent of the water quality problem, but what's its causation? And that came through a joint fact-finding collaborative process, which then actually changed the research agenda to try and get a more granular understanding of that water quality causation, which then in turn could better inform the solution set. And so I, I, I wanna say that even problem framing uh, is uh, in some respects a kind of joint proposition between decision makers and scientists. It's a really good point. And that kind of brings back to some of the um, the themes from the first question of kind of the need to, you know, who's in the room, who are we listening to, um, thinking about equity. Um, I gotta say, this is a, a pretty agreeable panel. I was originally expecting there'd be some brawls. This has been pretty, pretty good. But also, I feel like every time one of you says something, I want like 30 seconds just to unspool it in my brain <laughs> and really process. There's a, there's a lot. Um, one thing I guess I wanted to, to pick on a bit is um, something kind of Mark said is that you know, there's sort of different different forms of science can all be good and that you don't necessarily have to want to have impact per se. And I thought that was really interesting thinking about, um, especially the idea of, you know, just because something is hard and you don't have impact doesn't mean it wasn't worth the struggle. Um, I'm curious how, how others feel about that. Like, is, 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 that a, is there a better word than impact? To, so is, is relevant really the right thing to say, okay, this is something that could be useful. This is something that I don't know if it's useful. And this is something that they did have impact. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm, I'm really thinking through that. Can I um, jump onto that, John? Um, we kind of like, a, we start looking into impact in, in a different scale and the bigger the scale is and bigger the impact is, better that is. I mean, that's kind of like a, that started, I don't know, it's like an idea 80s or anything. Uh, when you know a uh, 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 cynically global uh, uh, production enterprise is, is is taking over the world, so you know maybe there is something to say about that. But what I'm concerned about is you know that became the the, the kind of like a measurement of who's successful and who's not, and it must not be. I mean, as you know, we're actually looking into if you're looking into any of the environmental justice work. Uh, which scientists involved, they're all local, therefore the specific people, specific programs, and the specific addressing with the policy and the local government. Yeah, it wasn't really anything to make it sort of like a global or anything, but those, um, I wouldn't say the small scale, there's never be a small scale for the people who are really living in that situation. So I think that should be the impact. And then I think that should be something we should really think about it. And you know, I really think that this sort of like a global thing is just a, it's just a, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a very unsettled term that we created in order to make, you know, us who's not really stakeholder at the moment, the work more is always irrelevant, but it doesn't have to be. I, I want to say something that may be a little bit provocative, and that is to say that I think all knowledge is relevant and all knowledge um, yeah, is impactful, uh, but it comes at nested scales. And so if I look, for example, at the work that I did while I was at Interior on Everglades management, uh, you know, we needed to understand, for example, methylated mercury and how it affected uh, water quality, you know, at one scale. And that was a lot of very, very specific science. We needed to understand tree islands and we needed to understand uh, these various specific kinds of knowledge. But at the same time, you then needed to put Humpty Dumpty together. <laughs> that is, look at the whole and think what it means for actual restoration choices. And so depending upon sort of where you are in that decision granularity, virtually all knowledge is impactful, then it sort of tears up into the bigger picture. So uh, I, I, I don't wanna leave behind a lot of the basic research that gets us deeper and deeper knowledge but um, which is impactful in itself. But then we do face challenges of how to put that all together um, for large scale decision-making. Really good point. I, oh, sorry, Christian, go ahead. And I wanna jump in too. Uh, yeah, it's a good point. Um, but still, I want to contextualize that a bit. Well, a French colleague, uh, Bernard Hubert once said, when we talked about impact, and now I'm talking about uh, science having in impact on policy-making, he said, Christian, we are so lucky that not every 
advice of scientists is taken up by policymakers. What world would that be we would live in if they would <laughs> translate it one to one? And so I think behind that is, you're right, Lynn, certainly all knowledge is relevant. Uh, what happens usually, but we, if we look at the science impact, whatever complex system, then what usually happens, and Mark, I, I'm not sure what you think about that, what usually happens if we talk with researchers they have huge ideas of what they should how they should uh, change the world they work on i don't know climate um, snow the snow is the, the limit of the snow is going up in the mountains they think everybody should know that living in the swiss mountains and then we work on it okay okay what is actually the impact that you want to achieve and at the end they realize that in the small community where they work if in the community meetings uh, snow level rise is on the agenda wonderful impact already great for a phd or whatever it is so i think impact is okay but we should have realistic modest <laughs> ideas about what we can achieve uh, in a research project with i don't know 200 300 thousand dollars where other other forces are around not only us <laughs> yeah that's a good point and i should note there, there's a few voices in the literature um who actually act, argue that thinking about impacts can be harmful. So especially for, for you know, more junior uh, scientists, for people who are in sort of uh, less privileged groups that, you know, the, the, the uh, trying to achieve impact when it's not fully in your control can actually in some way harm people, which is interesting. Um, and so to Lynn's point about kind of, you know, all knowledge being potentially impactful, I guess the one thing that that um, was was first paralyzing then motivating for me was the paralyzing part is thinking, oh my God, to, to really have the best chance at impact, I've got to be, you know, co-designing and asking the right question and writing clearly and sharing it and all these things that felt like so much. But what was freeing was then to say, okay, well, I've spent, you know, maybe on average four years between you know, a year to get a grant, two years to do research, a year to get it published, and I'm now begrudging myself spending more than an hour emailing it or tweeting it. And that's kind of crazy, at least for me, to, to spend so much time in the research and so little time giving anyone a chance to read it. So like for the last paper I've worked on, I've spent probably three or four days of time on things like this, on emails, on promoting it, um, and, and you see the difference. And so that's the one thing I guess that, that to me is helpful is as much as it is hard being feeling like you have to be a superhero, there are so many people who, who can help you write better, share, ask the right questions, uh, broaden your knowledge. So anyway, for, for me, that's, that's that's one nice piece. So that's maybe a good segue then. Um, so if a few people in the chat have noticed, have been asking, well, hey, this, this sounds great, but it's really hard. So my, my third question for the panelists was really, um, what advice would you have for, for people who, who want to get better at this, who want to, to be able to have more impact? So I'm gonna share a screen, everyone's got a slide. Um, and maybe, I don't know, I, th I think take like, Three, three or four minutes for each of you, if you like, to kind of just talk through whatever you want. And then again, as a reminder for, for anyone in the Q&A, put any questions you have, you can upvote them. And, and after this, this last question, we'll turn it over and start diving into to your questions. So with that, I'm going to share my screen here. And I believe, Lynn, you're up first. Um, oh, you're on mute, Lynn. Here we go. Uh, thank you. This is something we actually haven't talked about. Um, you know, as a former policymaker, as a decision maker, I often find in discussions with uh, the scientific community that they sort of black box policy and decisions as one uniform set of things. And in fact, um, informing, uh, for example, uh, air quality standards in a regulatory process is yet again very different from, for example, uh, designing a carbon pricing uh, legislative scheme. And that in turn is very different from some of the things we've been talking about that is place-based resource management. And so it is not the case that there's a one size fits all in a relationship between science and decision-making. So foundational science, for example, uh, sea level rise estimates, global circulation models, uh, some downscaling, very foundational, under, under, gives us a foundational understanding of you know, what the world looks like. And that doesn't necessarily require those same collaborative processes that we've spent so much time talking about. But as you move along this, this little diagram here, and you're starting to look at coastal vulnerability, it start, you start to um, invoke questions that are not necessarily science only, 
but questions about what do people care about, values questions. So invoking participation so that you can illuminate those important questions become important. And then gosh, you get right down to, let's say Miami-Dade resilience plan or a coastal restoration plan, infrastructure design, you really are talking about uh, the interface of people in place. You are talking about not only how the world works, but what do people value? What are the trade-offs in those value sets? So I just wanna leave people with the, the notion that co-development near and dear to my heart, extraordinarily important, but it's not one size fits all and it's not relevant to all science decision-making interfaces. Great, thanks, Lynn. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, and it might be covered up, but I, there's a link here, which I can maybe put in the chat as well. Uh, sorry, give me one second. Um, because a lot of folks have great insights and different links, I wanted to um, make sure it was easy to get that. So where is my chat? Let's get more. All right, I apologize. I will do this after this bit, because I don't want to take too much time on it. So I'll just go back to sharing my screen. But I will. there's a link that has all of these different um, suggestions from everybody, which which we'll post in just a moment. So I think Yoshi, you're up next. Okay, um, John, I just have a publication at the PNAS. I co-write it, and I'm sorry, I'm just shamelessly promoting myself, but this is very concrete things that I wanted to um, share with the people, but I can't really have it over there. But these are things which I wrote it, and then those are institution and, and the things that I did and you know you can use it if you want but uh, so what I really think you know what we help for is it's it's those policy you know when we say policy often we don't know what we are talking about I gotta be honest with you and um, trained as an anthropology you know and then I worked in an institute that was working on ocean policy but just like I really didn't understand what do you mean by policy and then when I actually start you know, taking a policy course at Evans uh, uh, School of Policy in University of Washington, you know, I did executive MPA, and then I started understanding, okay, that's what it is. Um, so the policy is really the action to correct what's wrong, right? So, you know, what scientists could really do is to really help us to understand, I'm repeating myself again, what's wrong, and what really to understand what kind of like a policy intervention could potentially work. And that's not really the scientist work, but that's something the scientists can answer it. Um, one thing I just, do I have a time? Like 20 seconds. I was in Japan when 2011 Fukushima happened. And it's a little controversial thing to talk about it, but this is the, the time I really, really sought for the scientific knowledge. When the Fukushima happened, I was in Tokyo. I wasn't really know how dangerous we were. You know, I just had a two years old, my, uh, 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 no, 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 uh, two weeks old, my daughter. I was so scared. That time we need a scientist. And then that's the knowledge we really need. And then that's probably close to the basic science. So, you know, what I'm saying is that scientists, when you need to speak up, please speak up. When you can be in a place where people are not expect you to be, please try to be there. And when you have a bad news, trying to bring it and then try not to just follow the narrative of the things, you know, you're supposed to write, you know, how you write in a journal just to get published. Um, so yeah, yeah, here you go. I said it. Okay. Bye. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks, Yoshi. So uh, I guess we'll keep going and then we, we will have some time for everyone to kind of build on each other's thoughts. And again, all these links I'll post in the chat in just a moment. Um, I think Mark, you're up next. Short and sweet, but feel free to expand on that. You can take a few minutes. Great. So uh, I'm coming back to that concept of, of empathy. Someone, I think Bryce Perog said, uh, so uh, give us some examples. How does this actually work uh, in reality? And I'm going to get very practical. One method that we can all use to take that first step towards a more empathic and more effective approach for impact is to do a stakeholder analysis. So uh, on that resources link, you'll see uh, a load of things, including my guide to doing a stakeholder analysis. Uh, and now uh, in this particular research field area that I'm interested in, I'm asking who has a shared interest? Um, what might be their influence? Um, and, uh, and more directly, how might they be impacted positively or negatively uh, by, this, uh, by this issue or by the research that I want to do? Uh, and so from that, then, I'm going to uh, choose my top three. It could be a hard to reach group. It could be a particularly influential organization. Up to you. 
and I'm going to send uh, three emails out to them. Uh, but rather than starting, here is me, here is my research, I'm starting, here is you. Here are the challenges that, uh, that I understand you're facing or the objectives you're trying to achieve. I think I might be able to help. Can I have a conversation? And it is that conversation then that enables you to actually put yourself in their shoes and now see through their eyes what you might really be able to do to, to help. A uh, practical, practical example of this, um, I used this technique uh, to identify the most influential uh, organisation influencing UK policy on a particular issue, and that's why I'm research lead for this uh, particular charity. Um, uh, then uh, linked to that, I uh, discovered that there was a UN organisation set up uh, to address the same environmental problem. Uh, and uh, I went out and I met the, the head of this organization and I said, look, uh, I, I've researched what you're doing. I think that this is a, a concrete way in which I might be able to help. Uh, as a result, I'm now uh, very active, uh, leading on multiple streams of work for this organization. Uh, and there are a bunch of people who have professional jealousy who are saying, well, you, what right do you have to be advising this organization uh, when actually you haven't done work in the tropical area where a lot of their work is, is based uh, your whole career? You're not, you don't have enough expertise. Uh, and my response to them is, well, no, I don't, but I've got connections to people like you. And my task is simply to see how can I help? And I went and I asked the question and I connected these people who are making decisions to people who had answers. And you know what? You could have done that at any point, just gone and said, you know what? Here I am. Here you are. How can I help? And it is that, that empathic approach which ultimately opens doors and creates opportunities. Great. Thank you. Christian? Yes. Um, I also added, Yoshi, I also added one of the papers <laughs> I published here as a resource, the 10 steps. But basically what I wanted to say with this paper and uh, more with the toolbox just below is that, that there are plenty of online toolboxes um, with collections of tools and tools is a very broad uh, concept, tools, resources, uh, that you might explore if you are interested in doing knowledge co-production. There is the one that is here from the Transdisciplinarity Net in Switzerland. Then there is a toolbox from the, they have all different names from the science of team sciences in the US, from the integration to implementation sciences in Australia, uh, different names, all for the same thing. Those uh, are not only toolboxes, but behind those toolboxes, there are communities evolving, communities of scholars who are, for instance, uh, think like Christina, like thinking, oh, what should I do? Where is my career going on? And this is a slow process, a very slow process. And over the last 10 years, this community somehow started to connect. They have their own conferences where they meet. And this is like a mix of people who are more like in a specific topic and then they go to the conference just to see what kind of people are doing this integrative work, this impact work. And then they connect like Mark said, and then they can collaborate with people from there or it's people that think they belong to these integrators and connectors. Uh, some of them stay within academia, others are coordinators of, of big projects. That's a bit a mix of academia and management. Others are uh, facilitators that are outside academia, so to say. So, so I think currently, at least in Europe, uh, on, now in, Europe, in the whole world, uh, a kind of communities are building, very slow, very small communities, but it's still hard to get jobs. I mean, I, I'm very lucky that my, uh, university decided that they found three full-time jobs just for this transdisciplinary thing. I mean, I see several places in Switzerland where positions pop up, but uh, three of them in one unit is quite a bit. <laughs> Great. John, so, uh, oh. I'm so sorry, just a tiny thing. I learned, or, or I'm actually working with uh, Professor uh, Grant Broom at Evans School of policy and, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the cases to make a policy analysis. And what we tend to actually confuse is what the policy analysis and what the policy research is. And so, you know, that's the first things I learned. So, you know, I'm going to produce these and, and then I'm hoping to share with you in the future, but uh, this is some sort of like a distinction, you know, perhaps we need to understand. There's a policy research to think about like, what is a policy needed and all this. Policy analysis is specifically targeted to the people that we wanted to talk to, either policy makers or public or anything. And for the specific issues 
um, really well scoped. And there's a very different disciplines and we need to distinguish it sometimes to make a right impact. And a, sci a Forbes scientist can engage with policy analysis with their colleague at the university or somewhere. It's a great, it's a great distinction. Um, so the last thing I'll throw in, uh, I also have my email up here. So if any of you um, have questions, I think we're going to send in the, in the email all of the, the, the panelists' emails as well. But um, you can get me at jfisher at futrust.org, and I'll, I'll post the link to all these advice uh, in just a moment. Um, so the only advice I wanted to add, I think there's a lot of great things to build on there. Um, but just that I mentioned this before, there's lots of small steps you can take to improve your impact. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to try things. Um, don't be afraid to fail. And don't be afraid to, to experiment. So um, as much as possible, if you feel like you, and to kind of some of the points earlier, if you don't feel like your strengths are in communicating, great, find something else to do. <laughs> and if you don't feel like your strengths are in you know, uh, writing, Ask, a help, ask for help. You know, I had uh, my wife helped me at my paper. I asked for help from family, friends, um, and it makes the writing much stronger. Although one of our editors told us that it was written too simply and that our, our paper looked like it was written for undergrads and therefore no one would take it seriously, uh, which we all took as um, the first half of that sentence as a compliment. <laughs> I guess the jury's still out on the second half. Um, oh, and then yeah, to plug, to also plug my paper, I've got one here. So this, this whole journey for me really started uh, geez, three or four years ago, but we had a paper come out last year that was sort of our, our first, uh, my co-authors and I first set of tips, uh, but I'm already learning through things like this, what else we missed and what we got wrong. Um, so with that, I wanna, I wanna give the panel, I guess, kind of a few minutes to, to react to each other's thoughts before we turn to Q&A. And one thing I wanted to, to, to mention, a few of you kind of know, mentioned the idea of centering out on yourself, but on the people you're working with. And there's a metaphor I loved from Nancy Duarte, who does um, science or just communication training. And she says, when you're giving a talk, think of the audience as Luke Skywalker and you as Yoda, this is the Star Wars reference. So the idea is you're not the hero, your job is to support them in what they need. And I thought that was a really great way for me to remember that. So every time I write a talk, I think, well, what, what do they need? Not what do I want to make them do? Um, <laughs> But for, for anyone, any thoughts about kind of um, building on what we've seen? I'll, I'll stop my screen so we can see each other better. Did I break it with a Star Wars reference? <laughs> um, can I, go, John? Yeah, um, great. Um, Sometimes I speak like a Yoda, just inheriting my Japanese grammatical thinking into in English. So <laughs> I might have a natural tendency. Anyway, um, so when I was working on kind of like a paper to advise decade of ocean science, which is going on right now, just started. And me and my colleague, Joel Singh, Harriet Hurden Davis, and I just have to drop the name because you know, they're the one who worked hard most. Um, we really came to this like a discussion. We said, okay, we need to, we, we must know the need of coastal communities and, you know, to make the science uh, useful. And then we thought, okay, do we always need that? Can we say we must know the need for coastal communities? So we just had the debate, you know, need for sounds very kind of like a paternal, you know, sort of feeling that we actually carry, you know, the superhero type of thing. Need of, yes, but you know, it kind of like a confined space where the scientists can be very creative. And this is sort of a discussion I think we need to have. Yes, and everybody think about it again, what's the practical solution, Yosh? But I think this is what we need to think about how, when we're presenting our science and when we're actually engaging with a policy. You know, who are we really talking about and from what space we are talking about? And we don't have to explain ourselves. We don't have to depend on ourselves to engage with this kind of conversation. But, you know, that's, that's a kind of like a, uh, discussion I think we need to unpack it and, and, and therefore we can really reach to okay what's how did it start what's the systemic thing and then there was a question you know do we need to know the solution absolutely not we just need to know what the problem is and then it gets deeper and then deeper and then that's our job to explore and surely for the policy analysis we have to stop somewhere but that's another product so it's kind of like a compartmentalize our effort but at the same time, keep engaging ourselves in a core conversation. I think that would be very helpful. This is Lynn. I, I wanna go back to something that Mark said, um, which I think is important. And that is that um, in the reality of policy making and decision making at issue is not science based decisions, but science informed decisions. 
because the science can give us insights and illuminate how does the world work, I mean, to put it simply. But all policy and decision making are about what values do people care about? How, do, how does one prioritize that, those values? What are the trade-offs? And uh, also matters of experiential knowledge. That is, how does one pinpoint the possible or define the doable? So let me give you an example. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service biologists uh, doing some work off the coast of Alaska began to recognize that certain um, activities of the fishing community, in fact, were, uh, were uh, harming uh, albatross. Now, they could go in and provide that information, but by operating collectively with the fishing community, the fishing community has said, oh, we can change our practices. And that experiential knowledge, which ultimately informed the decisions and the practices undertaken, was not knowledge that would, would have been really in the purview of the scientists. It's the practitioners who are daily out on their boats and daily working with that equipment. And so I just wanna go back and, and emphasize that I think science informed is the concept within which to operate as opposed to science-based, which seems to presume that this is not about trade-offs, value sets, experiential knowledge, the interface of people and, and decisions. May I build on that? Christian speaking. Um, I think it's also the, there, what is also important is that by providing evidence, the thing is not over uh, because whatever the decision makers then do with this evidence will have, it's an intervention in a complex system, so it will have intended and unintended consequences. And I think it's still the job of science to be to observe <laughs> what happens and to look for surprises because then you can learn more about the system and so the, uh, the uh, and so that is what Lynn said with the practice part of the practitioners uh, in Europe we have the concept of real world labs or of living labs which is like the the idea that you do experiments in a re uncontrollable <laughs> real environment and then you try to find out how your solutions or whatever it is that you suggest how they work in reality and i think that's important to keep in mind that uh, with providing evidence the, the job of an analytical observation is not over it goes on <laughs> yeah that's, <laughs> that's a good way to phrase it um so I think I'd like to kind of pivot to the, the questions from the audience, because that's always um, one thing I hate about panels is you don't get, get to get a voice in. So we're going to go democratic, and I'm going to start with the most popular. So again, if you joined late, um, feel free to ask questions and to upvote the ones you like. Um, so the first question for the panel comes from Gregory Papp. It says, you all represent active and critical organizations in global science application. Can you talk a bit about the role of institutional barriers to doing boundary and transdisciplinary work? Classic, classic Western science reward incentive structures often don't match the needs and values of the humans and ecosystems they aim to serve. Yeah, I'll, I'll put my hand up for this one um, and, and, uh, and say any kind of financial mechanism uh, because, uh, uh, or, or, yeah, any kind of reward system. I think that we, we assume that um, if we want to change uh, researchers' behaviours, we just change the reward system. And so you can simply point to the, the reward system that we have that says, well, we need uh, more papers in the right kinds of journals and, uh, and more grant applications and income, etc. Uh, and of course, that doesn't uh, incentivize people to, uh, to generate impact. And so uh, the obvious answer is, well, hey, we just need to attach a financial value to impact or um, uh, in integrate impact into our promotion procedures, etc. cetera. Um, and we've done that. And as a result, created uh, some really unfortunate uh, negative unintended consequences, in particular conflicts of interest. Uh, where now we have people who, uh, a recent mentee came to me and said, 
so I want a promotion. Um, I need you to help me get impact so I can get, an, uh, get a promotion. Uh, and now I'm going to do a bunch of stuff to get impact, uh, not because I actually care about any of these people. And as soon as I've got my promotion, I'm going to drop all of this stuff, of course, because, yeah, this is how you get a promotion nowadays. <laughs> uh, the, uh, one of my colleagues, Jen Chubb, published research where researchers admitted lying on grant applications, saying that they were going to achieve impact that they told her they had no intention of ever doing, uh, knowing that the funders wouldn't ever actually follow up on that stuff. Uh, so the, the answer can't be more, more incentives or, or different incentive structures. We have to understand what is it that ultimately is motivating people and get to those intrinsic motivations, which means as managers, we need that, to take that type of empathy as well. Uh, so what is it that inspires you most? And that's what I start all my trainings with. Uh, what inspires you? What are your intrinsic motivations? And now from that place, whether it's challenge or there's curiosity, whether it's, you know, maybe it is impact, it's an intrinsic thing. Now ask yourself, how might engaging with impact actually inspire you more to do better research, uh, to be more curious or whatever it is? We need to think about mechanisms that can enable us to do that kind of stuff, which is the focus of my next book, Impact Culture. I'm glad you pivoted at the end there, Mark, from the kind of people are going to just lie about their impact and game the system to figure out what inspires you. Uh, so any other panelists want to jump on this question or should we go to the next one? Um, just the one thing, uh, Mark, I admire what you just said. Absolutely brilliant. Um, but another thing is, you know, when we work in with foundations, um, um, you know, there is there is an issue of the power structure. Um, clearly, the, the the decisions that made it, and and yeah, you are in a, in a foundation too. But the decisions is made, and 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 the kind of like attraction they have, or it's 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 not really, you know, decided or, or selected by the need of the people. But I think things are changing. They really need to be accountable for it. So scientists can actually start asking to the foundations or anybody else, you know, what you what you think about, like you know, the logic model or theory of change and can I actually see it or where does it come from you know do you actually know that doesn't really work and it hasn't been working for a long time you know such as we need the money to change the world I don't think it has worked as we see it in our country so you know those are things I really think this the the the, the, the this issue of the past structure is 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 creating institutional values and um, uh, um, institutional collaborations and at the same time we are now in a place where we're going to actually ask back about it and push back about it. Great. And Christian, did, did you say you wanted to jump in as well before we move on? Or? Uh, yes, perhaps short uh, answer. I mean, as I said, our institution is quite generous, three full-time jobs for this kind of research, but still, I mean, the main part of our institution is hard scientists. <laughs> so there is a, a bit of, there is institutional support. Uh, on that side. So, and the, the reward system, the other reward system, I mean, I'm from the funding side, I was now part of two funding schemes where they combined the usual Na National Science Foundation expert panel with uh, inter and transdisciplinary specialists. And I think that's very interesting. So they don't ask us to become part of the main decision body, but they ask us for our opinion, which is already something and, and goes a little bit in direction of uh, uh, really selecting good inter and transdisciplinary research of people that are really motivated to do so. But still, on the other hand, I made a big, uh, I made, a, I tried to get a lot of money from Swiss National Science Foundation and we said, okay, one third of the money is to build up a learning process. <laughs> and <laughs> where we just do workshops, talk, meet, drink, <laughs> build communities of practice. That's one part what we did. The other part is we had a theory of change, very clear. But if you do such a theory of change, uh, a modest one, right? And, and this has to, to um, is in, in competition with the traditional researchers who say, well, we will solve the whole world. I think this is even, a, a, this hinders your success you, because you're so realistic about your impact and the others are so unrealistic. <laughs> that is a very strange <laughs> way of, of, so I think there's also a risk in being very explicit about what you can achieve. Perhaps that's different in the UK where you have these impact models, but in Switzerland, this certainly is. Yeah, before we pivot, I wanted to pick up one thing you said to kind of the different sort of you've got funding for things. And I think that's another institutional barrier is sometimes is funding. 
Um, my favorite story of this that was like one of those really depressing moments was um, we were doing uh, five different papers all on knowledge diffusion. We had to get a quarter million dollars to kind of study knowledge diffusion at the Nature Conservancy. And we're just like, we're sciencing like hell and we're studying things, we're writing. And then at one point, um, the whole thing was to study how a new conservation planning methodology spread throughout TNC. And one of my colleagues said, you know, John, I'm really glad you all are spending so much uh, resources studying this. It'd be nice if we had more than zero dollars to actually promote <laughs> spreading the knowledge. <laughs> So here, because of just sort of the vagaries of budgeting and grants, you know, we had a ton of money to study something which was not happening that much because there was no resources to actually promote the thing we wanted to study. Um, so I think that is another kind of funny barrier is that science sometimes is a different budget line for implementation. Um, and we can talk about that being good or bad. Uh, I do want to pivot. There's, a, there's another um, great question here, which I think brings up, uh, touches on something that both Yoshi and Christian mentioned, which is where are the jobs to support transdisciplinary science, racial equity and inclusion specialists, to kind of build our understanding of community and social science. We've been saying this is missing for years. And uh, this is from Christina Burasa, who says she's got a, a graduate degree to be a transdisciplinary scientist, but then, you know, doesn't seem to be specialized enough. And sort of as panelists, how can we push for hiring atypical candidates as opposed to more people? And so any thoughts about kind of where are the jobs and also any advice to help people sneak through academic barriers and, and get us a seat at the table to make this happen? Lynn, I'll, I'll, so at the Nature Conservancy, of course, I don't reside in the academic context. So others will have to weigh in specifically on that. But what I would invite people to think about is whether that academic context is where they really want to be. That is, if you're interested in transdisciplinarity, if you're interested in the application of that transdisciplinarity, well, that is precisely the kind of thing that a conservation organization like the Nature Conservancy um, is engaged in. We, we, we have a lot of scientists, but we're always looking at our conservation and climate action goals and looking at the interface of how that science can, can inform um, the work that we're trying to do. And increasingly, that's at very large scale. It involves people and nature, therefore transdisciplinarity is essential. So I guess I would just invite people to think about uh, whether their interests are such that they really want to be in the academic context, or might they want to be in a, in a, in a context where application is what the focus is? Yeah, I, I think that this is for, for early career researchers dictated primarily by funders, uh, what kind of projects are funders seeking, uh, and hence what jobs are available linked to those projects. And so uh, what I'd recommend is, that, is looking nationally for where there are countries that are heavily prioritizing impact um, uh, and funding projects that are focused on impact. Um, and I, I see you're from the, from the US, Christina. Um, in the UK, uh, there's a, a lot of emphasis across our, uh, our funders uh, and uh, the calls for proposals on impact. Uh, and as a result, uh, there are lots of transdisciplinary, not just interdisciplinary projects, um, and many opportunities for postdoctoral researchers who have those transdisciplinary skills. Um, uh, in terms of the, the US, uh, I think this is changing. Uh, we're seeing a growing emphasis on, on impact. And my hope is that this is going to be a growing trajectory that we will, as we see more transdisciplinary research projects funded, there will be more and more jobs. Anyone else want to jump in or should we move on? There's a bunch of awesome questions here. All right, maybe we'll, we'll pivot. Um, and uh, Gregory Papp apologized for having another question, but we're, we are going to go democratically. So <laughs> Gregory gets another cut at this. Uh, this is a great one. So it, attempts by scientific institutions to remain apolitical are inherently political and in that they favor the status quo. Um, what do you think is the role of science as activism in a time of science denial at the highest levels of decision making? I mean, I'll add to that, this came up yesterday as well, that, um, that if in a, in a white supremacist or um, non-egalitarian culture, there is this, this same notion that, you know, keeping things as they are is not a, a neutral decision. Um, so yeah, what, is, what do you think? The role of science is activism <laughs> uh, and sort of, you know, favoring the status quo. See a couple of hands. Um, yeah, let Mark, you go and then I'll follow up. Great. So I feel quite strongly about this. I, a lot of people put a lot of pressure on me because I do climate research um, that I should be a, a climate activist. 
uh, and, and I push back and say, you know what, this uh, there should be no shoulds here. This is an individual decision that we all need to make based on our own beliefs and values. I was going to share my screen here. Um, uh, this is uh, something that I use in, in my training. Um, uh, and the idea here is that, uh, that depending on how you see what is knowledge, what constitutes valid knowledge, or as social scientists call it, epistemology, uh, and how uh, close uh, or far removed uh, you feel comfortable being, uh, there are four different roles that you can inhabit. And campaigner is one of them. It's a valid role. Uh, and there are many um, uh, people in, uh, in more kind of positivist uh, disciplines uh, who've been trained in that way, who find it objectionable and fundamentally uneth unethical uh, to, to be a campaigner. And others who say, you know, it is your responsibility to be a campaigner. Uh, what I think we need to do is ask ourselves, uh, how close do we feel comfortable getting? What is our epistemology? And as a result, where do we want to be? And to actually think about this, this, this is an individual choice. Yeah, I'd like to build on, um, Mark, your comments, and uh, but start with a predicate. And that is, first of all, we started this conversation talking about impact and relevance. And I just want to make the point that impact and relevance are not the same as political av advocacy. They are, they are different things. One can be very imp impactful and not necessarily a campaigner. But the second thing I want to say is really build on exactly what Mark said, which is that uh, there's a whole continuum of ways of engaging in policy relevant uh, intersection between one's science and the world around us from uh, the four elements that, that, that Mark laid out uh, and there are other typologies for that. I do want in that regard to, and it is a, an individual choice. I mean, it is not a should. Um, and, and all along that continuum is relevance to try and inform the world and get, get, um, uh, get results that uh, for the world and the betterment of people and the planet. Um, but I do want to turn people's attention to a Nat National Research Council uh, book that came out, I think around 2011 or something. I'll have to get John, you, the, the, the exact title of it, but it essentially is on um, uh, uh, science and decision making. And it lays out a five point continuum of levels of engagement and what's very interesting about it is that not only does it lay that out, but it also sort of sets forth some of the considerations of how one situates oneself in what context along that continuum. So I'll get that. I can't remember the exact title. It's like Science and Decision Making, something like that, National Research Council. But it's extremely well done um, and thought provoking book. Good question. In the, in the transdisciplinarity community, we, we think that research can provide three types of knowledge to decision making or whatever, however it's called. Knowledge about how it, is, how it is, the current situation, knowledge about where we should go, that's normative knowledge, knowledge about how to get there, right? transformation knowledge. So that means that we think science can surely contribute to normative questions of where to go. Uh, probably I'm the critical friend, Mark, I don't know. And uh, in a, implemented, that means uh, I think it's crucial for all these projects that suggest change that they make for themselves and for the others clear what they mean by, what goal they have in mind, for instance, sustainable development, what they mean by sustainable development, what exactly is meant by the ecological, what is exactly meant by justice. So all these things can be uh, reflected and make explicit. And once they are explicit, they can be criticized by the different people in the group. I think that is for me the way how we can be activists. We can sure be activists, but we should be very reflective uh, about the values that are underlying our, our research. It's a great, and this has come up a lot, kind of being clear on values and not thinking of yourself as a valueless uh, fact robot. Um, this actually is something that came up earlier. I was talking to a young scientist and always part of my, my top three advice for people, because I think it's one of the hardest things to learn is to understand your own bias. Um, and this applies in a, in a, you know, in terms of racial and gender equity, it, it applies in terms of just which scientists you trust, which, which, you know, what's your emotional reaction. And so 
the thing I think is really interesting is I've, I've gotten very practiced at observing my bias, befriending my bias, because I can't fix it. I'm not going to become unbiased, but I can know it really well, have it mapped out so I can observe my gut clench when I think something's exciting because it triggers positive bias in me and my squinting when I think something is nonsense, I'm going to not give it a fair shake and I can correct for that. But then there's also the hardest part of bias of, of what, are you, what do you not even know? Who are you not listening to? Which values haven't you been exposed to? And I think that's something that for me is, is definitely one area of growth I want to kind of work on is, is more is, um, so in thinking about, you know, science is being um, apolitical, yeah, so maybe it's, it's just not, <laughs> and maybe it's more understanding what is the politics underlying our science and being transparent about it so that we can at least have an authentic conversation. Um, can I uh, jump on a little bit? So, um, you know, this kind of activist conversation always reminds me of the case of Minamata, which, you know, most of the people you know about the ocean pollution, and it became a convention. And, you know, it was really happened to be this just a small village in, 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 in the south of Japan where the fishermen or fishing community just start eating the fish, which was um, uh, polluted by uh, mercury, and then they start getting this disease. And when that happens, oh, you know, it's a tiny fishing village, and, 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 and there was a big company, and, and the local government, everybody else was just protecting those companies. And the village themselves was just really suffering, and it took such a long time. And those who came to help the village was the students or scientists, and, and, and who really come, came from just to feel the empathy and, 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 and the devotion, and, you know, thinking about like a justice to help those people. Clearly, that doesn't really come up with this sort of like impact uh, scale because it was the hardest things to just change. You know, the government, local government, industry, it was just such a, it took a, such a long time to change. I think it took about like 20 years. They're still suffering from, you know, the courts and, and everything. So I really think, you know, when we talk about like when we put our activist hat or scientist hat, I don't think there's just clear cut. But what I think is we must really think about the way that impact is 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 measured you know not for us to make a very immediate change because immediate changes is, is there is a reason why it changed immediately you know and 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 because so um um you know that's that's because and instead of we started with the impact so i should i thought i should come back i'm so sorry i'm still putting my heads together but you know that's, that came up to my mind. Sorry, John. That was, that was great. In fact, that was perfect because you gave a perfect pivot to the next question on the list uh, since you mentioned empathy. And so the, the next question from Bryce uh, Perag, um, and apologies if I pronounce your name incorrectly, please let me know in the chat. Um, but Bryce wants to know, what are some examples of how you integrated social science and empathy into implementing your research and how did it impact your success? And this is something I think I have no successful <laughs> stories of. This is sort of another area of growth for me. So I would love to, to hear from others. Um, Integrating social science empathy into implementing research and how did it impact success? It's a little tiny question. I'll give you an example from today, actually, if, uh, if that helps. Um, uh, so, uh, so for me, uh, this answers another question in, in the chat as well, actually, that there is what I would describe as, as impact potential. Um, uh, so uh, it's about being in the right place at the right time. People talk about serendipitous impacts um, that just happens randomly. Uh, but what most of those impacts have in common is that there was one person, at least, who was in the right place at the right time. And social media, of course, makes that uh, very easy to, to be in that right place. Uh, and, uh, and so for, for me, um, I have joined a number of networks and one crucial network in this particular case uh, was a network of conservation finance uh, pioneers uh, in Scotland. Um, uh, and through that, I discovered that uh, there were some stakeholders uh, working with the investment community who were saying they wanted to create a salt marsh code that could channel private investment into uh, salt marsh creation, restoration, uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, and uh, although I know nothing about salt, salt marshes, uh, I created something called the Peatland Code. Um, so I figured, huh, okay, that's interesting. Um, I wonder uh, if that's what you're kind trying to create. And they said, yeah, we want the Peatland Code, but for salt marshes. Uh, and so, so then I went to my, my research networks and uh, one of my colleagues was a collaborator on a project with some researchers who wanted to do the same thing a number of years ago. They didn't get the funding. Uh, and so he then put me in touch with those researchers. I put those guys together. Um, and as of today, we now have a meeting uh, between uh, the, the, the stakeholders and the researchers to try and put this, the, this all together. 
And the crucial thing here in terms of that empathic step was that uh, I was able to then go to those researchers and say, look, uh, here are a bunch of stakeholders and this is why they are interested in this. Uh, these are the resources they've got. Uh, the, these, this is the expertise they've got. Uh, when you put that together, actually, do you think that there is uh, perhaps an unconventionally funded research project that, that you could uh, achieve? Uh, and so this is not now uh, the, just uh, a bunch of researchers, uh, as they tried previously, uh, pitching an idea to a research funder saying, hey, this would be a good idea. This is a bunch of researchers now, uh, through me, being in the right place at the right time, working with some stakeholders who actually have access to unconventional funding and resource and expertise who can enable those researchers to do what they envisaged all those years ago uh, through different means. And so it's about that connection and about being able to try and understand from these different perspectives, well, what actually do you need? What, is, uh, what are the requirements? Um, and then putting people together based on that felt need rather than just some grand idea from a researcher that may or may not hit the mark um, and really deliver change. Give a different kind of response. I think that's, that's uh, very, very um, useful, Mark. But I wanna come at this question of empathy and research from a different angle. Um, if you look at um, a lot of air quality research, um, historically, a lot of that research looked uh, sort of, uh, you know, broadly, what's the what's the level of air quality uh, here, there, or somewhere? But when you begin to uh, empathetically think of communities affected by adverse air quality, it can actually uh, shift you to asking different kinds of, say, distributional questions. That is, where are the adverse effects of air quality most, uh, most pronounced? That in turn can actually then uh, weigh, then getting, getting insights into that um, and into sort of hot spots and how communities are affected uh, that arise from concerns expressed by those communities can in turn then affect, for example, your design of uh, say um, air quality uh, policy interventions, uh, where you're going if you're doing carbon pricing, how do you redesign that in a way that you're not simply uh, keeping burdens in certain communities, uh, but rather are you know investing let's say the the money that flows from that carbon pricing back into those communities. So it's it's a very different kind of approach thinking about empathy, but again, it causes you to ask a different kind of research question, one distributionally focused rather than more in the aggregate, for example. Great, thank you. Christian and Yoshi, you both wanted to get in? Yeah, um, so I, it, I for me to just take the, the, the question, you know, social science, it's, it's, it's really working in uh, different levels, but you know, for the empathy, uh, particularly um, uh, about the risk and, and and impact of the change for our entire environment, um, I think unfortunately nature will take care of it. Well, it's not really nature; we caused it. But you know, for example, this summer I'm I live in Seattle, and Seattle area because of the wildfire, we just covered completely few days or weeks um, that we couldn't go outside of it. And then I'm talking about like very expensive, you know, the, the, the including very expensive residential area where Jeff Bezos and um, uh, Bill Gates are living. They couldn't do anything, you know? So it just makes us realize wherever you are, whatever, you, and obviously, <laughs> you know, I don't have to talk about COVID. Wherever you are, the money or anything cannot really protect yourself. You just really have to work with it. The somebody's risk is your risk tomorrow. So I think, you know, potential social scientists could really just enlarge this conversation and with the natural scientists can really, you know, tell those people, you know, that, that if you think you can protect yourself with money and the things that you have, you got to be joking, you know. So that's really the conversation potentially we should have. But unfortunately, nature and us is taking care of that boundary, which is sort of okay. But uh, yeah, it's scary though. Christian, do you want to close this yes. one up? Short answer, um, how we try to create empathy. Um, this is from teaching. The students at some point have to do a stakeholder analysis and then they have each student group has to do a wanted poster from one specific stakeholder. So they have to draw a picture that shows this specific stakeholder situation. And then we, we, we went into the area where the stakeholders live and they had to present this 
poster to the person that they described. <laughs> and I think this creates a lot of empathy because all of a sudden you think, oh, how can I describe this person so that it's not insulting him or her, that it's correct? So you have to, as Mark said, step into the shoes of this person. So by exposing your results to those that you would describe. That's great. We have a lot of other great questions we're not going to have time for because they're mostly big. So I'm going to do one last lightning question before we kind of close up because I think this is a good one that lends itself to a one sentence answer. So the question is, what is one technical skill or technique or approach you wish you had learned as a student or it could be one that wasn't available and that you wish you could learn now? Um, I'll give my answer first, which is I wish I'd learned how to read, synthesize and understand scientific articles and to know when it's okay to, to not read one and give up. <laughs> that was really hard for me to learn and I still suck at it. I'm going to go for impact planning using logic models, and I'll put a link to an example. Great. Anyone else? One skill yeah. you wish you learned? Um, yeah, some of my students are listening, so it's embarrassing. Statistics. I hated it. I wish I liked it, and I wish I worked hard. <laughs> Winner, Christian, you got one? Yeah, I think that's hard, but I think what they didn't tell us where my, during my studies is that there are areas in this in this world that are absolutely not conceptualized and where all the concepts that they have in mind are not useful. And if they have, only would have told me that and given example, that would have been great, would have helped me a lot. Well, I have a, this is sort of such a such different origins uh, than perhaps the scientists on this panel, and so much of my science learning. Um, has occurred sort of learning by doing. Uh, that is the experiential knowledge for being eight years day in and day out at the Department of the Interior, managing 500 million acres of the United States um, and having to learn about, you know, the uh, Osmo regulation of a salmon versus, let's say, uh, probabilities of offshore oil spills. And uh, so I just want to put a big plug in. There's a lot you can learn through your through your academic work and your and your uh, university um, underpinnings, but there's also a lot you can learn by just getting out there and having some experiential knowledge, uh, working with some uh, practical situations. Really good point. Uh, I often tell people my my brother is a senior consultant for Accenture and he graduated with a cinema studies degree. So whenever I hear people in middle school being like, "I have to get into this engineering middle school program," so that in ten years I can do this, it's like. It's going to be okay. You will learn on the job. Uh, so I want to, to, to start closing. Thank you all so much. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to the participants and all the awesome questions. Um, so I just put again in the chat a link to the advice I'll synthesize. I'm going to save the chat and, and see if I can save it out to everyone as well, because there's a lot of amazing resources being sent. Um, I'm also looking forward to listening to this recording again and taking some furious notes, because I feel like I was learning a ton, but I want it to sink in. Um, I just want to notice a couple kind of quick themes I think I heard that were really interesting. I thought it was interesting in the first question, how everyone really talked about the human dimension, the need for empathy, thinking about equity, uh, diversity and justice, um, thinking about your values and not thinking that science is absent of that. Um, for the second question on kind of getting help, I, I loved Yoshi Sun's quote that superheroes are bad and they solve their problems with violence and we shouldn't have them be the, <laughs> the aspiration, but really that you know we all should be building on our strengths there's no one one right way to be a scientist. Um, and yeah, I think also uh, there was a lot of amazing advice, but I do like, I think, I can't remember even who said it, but just the, the beginning with the question of how can I help is a really good <laughs> short, succinct way to think about um, you know, some of this as a scientist. So I wanna close to give you all a minute or two to, to take a break before the next meeting we probably have. Um, but thank you, this was a lot of fun and I learned a ton um, and stay tuned for links to the recording and some resources as well. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, John. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you, Lane. So Thanks, for Thanks to Octo. I forgot to say that again. Mike. Thank you so much for hosting. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, John. Really helpful and awesome. So it was great. Yeah. Thank all right. you. That's which is all. Okay. okay. And John, you'll need to close the meeting since you're host. Great. I'm just going to save the chat. And do you, do you know if I can save the QA too, or is there? Um... It, I'll get it. Yeah. Okay. It's awesome. automatically saved to me. All yeah. right. And I'll end the session. Thanks so much again, Sarah and Nick. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you.